thank you uh, for being here. What is a biologist like me doing amongst the technorati? Um, kudos for the cross-fertilization. Um, it's, it's quite amazing. It's what I've wanted for a long time. Um, let me tell you a story. When the book first came out, I went to Barnes & Noble to find out where it was, where it was shelved. And cross-fertilization is not as easy as we think. I mean, those categories are very, very finely divided. Um, and I went and I looked in the nature section, and I finally found it in, the, actually, the technology section next to the Big Idiot's Guide to Cobalt or something. It was, it was in the really in the technology section. So I went to the bookseller, and I said, um, OK, this book is, I think it's misshelved. And I tried to explain. Biomimicry is, it's really in the fertile crescent between biology and engineering and design. It's, it's, it's not using natural materials. It's not genetically engineering organisms, it's not using organisms at all. It's taking the ideas and the design principles from biology and using them to inform human systems design. And at this point, he was pretty much had his finger on the security button. <laughs> because it, we know if you've written a book, that kind of postpartum, you're, you're a little bit crazy and you're telling a little bit more detail than you should. And um, he waited for me to finish. And then he said, lady, look, you've got nature and you've got technology. You've got to choose one. <laughs> Which um, has brought us to the conundrum that we're in right now. That myth has brought us to the conundrum. Of course, I see nature as a supreme technologist, chemist, engineer. Um, and hopefully, um, you might too at the end of this. Let me tell you another story. Um, this is a picture from a Galapagos Island trip I took. As a biologist now, I'm working with um, businesses who are trying to become more sustainable in their practices. So I went to the Galapagos with a group of wastewater treatment engineers. These are people who make, you know, the water purification system for San Francisco, for instance, called Corolo Engineering. And we were there to learn from the natural world. And they were a little resistant. You know, they said, well, you know, we do biomimicry. We use bacteria to clean our water. And I said, yeah, well, that's bioassisted processing. That's bioprocessing. But this is about what you can learn from these organisms. And again, a pretty blank, a blank gaze um, until we were actually walking on the beach one day. And I said, tell me what one of your big sustainability speed bumps is. And they said, well, it would really be helpful if we could find a way to stop scaling inside pipes, mineral buildup inside pipes. Because right now, when it builds up, you know, the aperture closes, and we either have to flush it with toxins, or we have to dig up the pipes. It's a problem. So we were looking at shells like this. And I, and I picked them up, and I said, what is your mineral buildup? What's scaling? And they said, oh, it's calcium carbonate. I said, well, that's what this is. And this self-assembles out of seawater. It, it crystallizes out of seawater. It's templated by a protein. And then it crystallizes out of seawater. It's scaling. And they didn't know this. They didn't know the way that seashells, that basically inside their pipes, there are seashells growing. It's the same sort of process. And then one of them stopped and said, well, if that's crystallization, calcium carbonate out of seawater, then what makes a shell a certain size? Why isn't it infinite in size? Why doesn't it just keep crystallizing? And then they all sort of leaned in. <laughs> and I said, because they also, in the same way that they, there's a protein that they, they uh, exude, and that becomes the template for crystallization of the shell out of seawater, there's another protein that adheres to the growing face of the crystal and stops the crystallization. Well, from then on, 
everything changed. I mean, in the first day, they were click, 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 you know, constantly taking pictures and then back in the boat after five minutes when we would go hiking or back in the boat after snorkeling. After that, we could not get them back in the boat. They were like little kids crawling all over the Galapagos Islands. What happened was they realized that uh, the locals had already solved many of the engineering problems that they were looking for. By the way, there is a product called TPA, which is a, um, an environmentally friendly product that's, that mimics these proteins and that is an alternative now for them. So basically there's 3.8 billion years of R&D and quite a few consultants for free, 10 to 30 million. And the most important thing is that the solutions are solved in context. It's the same context that we're solving our problems in. It's this earth context and they're well adapted. So biomimicry is basically the conscious emulation my definition of a smart guy on the left there, Al and Owl, um, of life's genius. And by that I mean designs and processes and strategies and hairdos. As you know, it, in, in technology, biomimicry is, has greatly inspired computing, pretty much on the software side. Neural nets, evolutionary computing, uh, computing software that mimics gene development, that mimics developmental biology that mimics flocks and swarms and, and the immune system. That's not what I'm going to talk about because I'm more interested these days in what we haven't looked at for mimicry and that's the hardware. Okay, because Silicon Valley Toxic Coalition says there's about 100 carcinogens in the water around Silicon Valley. The hardware, these things are not very high tech in that they kill you, so you should probably kill them before they kill you, is the uh, message there. So if we were to redesign the hardware for everything, not just computing, just this whole place, this building, the, the plane we came in, the cars we drove up in, what should we ask? As Bruce Mao said, you know, the important thing is that he's been playing with is this concept of what's worth doing. And that's a really, really good question. And once we figure out what's worth doing, which to me would be flourishing forever, our species and others, then the question is, okay, in the next 10 years, what should we ask? There are a lot of cool technologies out there, a lot of cool adaptations. What are the ones that are most important right now? Probably three categories I'm interested in. How does life make things? Not like this. I mean, we do a lot of top-down manufacture. We carve things down with heat, beat, and treat, what material scientists call heat, beat, and treat. Heating it up, treating it with chemicals, um, high pressures. 96% waste, only 4% product. Okay, so it's not, it's not a very smart way to do things. Life does exactly the opposite, bottom-up assembly, self-assembly to shape. So how does nature make things? How does nature make the most of things? This is a pollen grain, geranium pollen grain. Look at the shape. What a great thing for tumbling around in Brownian motion. What great shape. What great lightweight uh, shape. Life uses in energy to add information to matter. Because as Julian Vincent says, shape is cheaper than material. And finally, how does life make things disappear into systems? Because there really aren't any, any such thing as a thing in the natural world. It's, it's systems. As far as the difficulty level, we're pretty good at mimicking form, that hooks and barbules on that feather. The next thing is that mimicking process. How is it made? And that's the whole world of green chemistry. And then even the, the interesting thing about that green chemistry is that that owl has to live 
in a watershed, in a forest, in a watershed, in an ecosystem. And the rules by which it makes its things scale at all levels of the biosphere. We haven't, we haven't quite gotten that yet. But mimicking ecosystems is remaking our industries so that they are like food webs. Remaking our economy so it's like a living system rather than like a machine. Increasing levels of difficulty. Um, let me try to run down um, an agenda, perhaps, of, of what we should ask. The things that are interesting me right now about, you know, in this flow structure that's being created between the ideas in biology and human systems design, I'm watching some big ideas that I think are very, very potentially important for getting us through this evolutionary knothole that we're in. Let me try to run through them really quickly. Self-assembly is one of them. I mentioned this. Th that's a picture of, uh, well, let me get this thing. That's a picture of, this is an abalone shell, mother of nacre. It's a layered structure of mineral and polymer. It's twice as tough as our high-tech ceramics. Jet engine ceramics, um, missile cones, twice as tough because of this soft polymer in between the mineral. It's chalk, but because of the structure, it's really, really tough. The self-assembly is the most exciting thing. Water-based chemistry, ions in the seawater, templated to a particular place on that template, grow into a particular crystal form that's really, really strong. We're mimicking it now. These are, um, there are self-assembling PV cells. There's a guy um, at Sandia National Labs named Jeff Brinker who's doing amazing work with being able to coat a substance or make a hard case for something like this in a one beaker process in which he dips into a water-based based, uh, process. He dips into chemicals that are, have a propensity to self-assemble, to jigsaw together. As he lifts, them lifts the object out, ev evaporation causes the three-dimensional molecules to come closer together and to jigsaw together. It's called evaporation-induced self-assembly. Imagine making all hard products in this way. Here are uh, silica, silicates. This is a diatom. Um, Morse at uh, UC Santa Barbara is finding a way now to self-assemble silicates. Might be interesting for you guys. This is a brittle star. Its body is covered with these lenses, which Lucent technologists have found are the best optic lenses that we know of, okay? Each of these lenses is a little eye. And um, at Lucent, they've now found a way to self-assemble this, these, crystals, these calcite crystals um, in a water-based process. This is very exciting to me. Um, life self-assembles starting from protein chains, like a necklace of amino acids. That's what a protein is, a necklace of amino acids. It's really cool. It goes from 2D, and then you let go of it in water, and it self-assembles into a 3D sub uh, structure, a machine, a protein. Um, this is a ribosome. This is actually the machine that makes proteins. And um, George Whitesides at Harvard is doing some amazing things with actually taking not, I mean, nanotechnology, of course, you're all, you're all familiar with, um, is the self-assembly at that level of scale, the nanoscale. He's doing things with taking a millimeter, um, tiny, tiny components of electronics on a string and having them coated with a solder and shaking them up in water and having them self-assemble into a three-dimensional functional uh, assembly. Interesting. Different than lithography. Chemistry in water. We do chemistry in organic solvents. Life does chemistry in water, using a very small subset of the periodic table. We use all of it. Exciting work going on at Cornell. Um, a guy named Geoff Coates has learned to take CO2, which we think of as the big poison of our era, 
and make biodegradable plastics out of it. That would be just like a plant taking CO2 and making carbohydrates, starches, glucose. What if we took CO2 and made biodegradable plastics? Solar transformations. These represent some of the, the real energy transformation networks on our planet. Um, and people at uh, ASU are mimicking a molecular-sized solar battery based on how the, this purple bacteria, this is a purple bacteria reaction center. Um, they're mimicking that. So imagine being able at some point to spray on in a self-assembly process onto the roof a coating that is waterproof and is also an energy harvester. Power of shape. Um, 3.8 billion years is a long time to tinker with shape. This is a uh, nautilus. And the shape that you see there is called a logarithmic spiral. And it's everywhere in the natural world, from ram's horns to galaxies. And there's something very, very interesting about it. For one thing, it's the way flow goes. So when you turn on a faucet, the vortex is a logarithmic spiral. Coming from that idea, wouldn't it be a good idea to make turbines, propellers, computer fans, in a shape that would allow air or water to go through them smoothly? And that's what a company called Pack Scientific is doing. This is a, a water aerator that's based on this curve, the logarithmic curve. And in their, they're coming out with computer fans very soon. Uh, muffin fans, and the tests are showing a 50% energy savings and 75% quieter just by playing with that shape. Shape for adhesion. These, this is the gecko, and these are fins that have a really bad case of split ends, as Autumn Keller says. And uh, we're mimicking that now in tape. What happens is those, those split ends adhere through van der Waals forces. It's a, it's a dry adhesion into the nooks and crannies of the wall. And we're making tape. Imagine products not, to get, not put together with glue so that they can never be recycled, like a lot of our computer cases, but imagine gecko tape holding them together so that you peel the parts apart when you want to recycle them. No glue, no VOCs, no toxins. Uh, University of Manchester has come up, and U UC Berkeley, a lot of people cooperating on this. This is shape two. This is a brown bird. This is a brown butterfly. That's the only pigment there. And what's happening is that it uses shape to play with light. Light comes in and it refracts through these layers. This is the morpho butterfly. Through these layers, and it it's called thin film interference. Same thing that you see on a CD that makes it iridescent. This is a fabric called Morphotex, and there's no pigment in it. Pigments are being banned. Look at the reach accords in Europe, and you'll see how many pigments are being banned. I know computer manufacturers and cell phone manufacturers want to know how to get beautiful color into their cases without pigment. Life uses the free energy of light to create color to your eyes, just with structure. So if you put self-assembly together with this, um, you get color while you're making shape. And maybe you get self-cleaning. This is a uh, lotus leaf. Just like most leaves, it's self-cleaning. Um, the way it does that, usually when we think of something clean, like a clean room, we think of making an absolutely smooth surface, right? But life has taken the opposite tack. Life makes a very bumpy surface. This is the surface on the, on the, uh, of a lotus leaf. Very bumpy, very waxy. Water balls up. Dirt particles, see these little dirt particles? They teeter on the mountaintops. Water balls up and it picks up the dirt particles as it rolls off. 
So in this case, this is a product called Lotusin by Ipso. It's a building facade paint, and rainwater cleans the building. So it's not a matter of what's a better detergent formulation. The question is, what do you want to do? You want to stay clean. You've got rainwater coming anyway. Shape. These materials uh, we now understand as being systems, um, as Bruce talked about, too. Um, this spider, for instance, has 30,000 sensory apparatus on each leg. Imagine that. So it can feel what's going on in its, in its web. Putting those into our materials is one thing. Hooking them up to a brain as small as a spider's is another. Um, this is a, a system. This is a hagfish. It's tied itself into a knot because then it moves that knot down its body to get rid of slime, copious amounts of slime that it forms to keep itself from predators. And if you take a hagfish and you put it in a five-gallon bucket of water, that bucket of water will be almost solid gel in seconds. There's a fibrous gel there. It's a system cross-links those fibers. It's not really a material, it's a system. That's John Goslin's work at University of British Columbia. You guys are probably familiar with genetic algorithms in which you have breeding, pop you have breeding populations of ideas, and then you pick the prize pig from two ideas in a, in a computer. You, you ask it to design a water system. It designs a water system, pipes, and and uh, angles and valves. It designs 20,000 water systems. You pick the two prize pigs. You mate half of the code of one and half of the code of the other and have another generation. You mutate it a little bit. In a very short period of time, you get an optimized system. Material upcycling is on the ecosystem side of things. Businesses are looking at this idea of waste equals food, but they're not really looking at decay so much as they're looking at what happens when those logs get picked up, the information, the embedded information in those logs, the structure, gets picked up by something like a mayfly. It gets upcycled to the salmon, upcycled to the bear. And that's what people are talking about, McDonough and that cradle to cradle idea. It's to keep materials flowing, have humans as part of the circulation of materials, take materials, add design, add information to matter, to upcycle them. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on in ecosystem mimicry. Ranches, ranching that mimics the way native ungulates graze. Agriculture that imitates the way a prairie grows. A perennial, not an annual, like ours. Polyculture, not a monoculture, like ours. John Todd with sewage treatment plants that mimic marshes and that actually use organisms to clean water. Movement and transport, there's lots going on here. All the robotic stuff that you hear about um, and that I think Tom will talk a little bit about, looks at how does, how does nature locomote. What's really interesting to me is how does nature transport, not just itself, but what are the best pathways for transporting flow, water, people, traffic, branching networks. This whole science of branching networks is amazing. Can learn a lot from resilience and healing um, information that's going on right now. Resilient science. How does an ecosystem thrown off its balance come back to center? Um, this is a company called Biosignal. It's a pretty exciting one um, in terms of healing. Antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance. Okay, resistance to antibiotics is a big, big problem. How do organisms surrounded by microbes in seawater keep their leaves clear of biofilms? Okay, this is what you do in biomimicry. You say, 
who in the natural world is doing exactly what I want to do and, and doing it really well, the champion adapter. Sea purse has no biofilm on it, lives in Botany Bay, Australia. What it's doing is it's releasing bacteria come down, they land on the surface, and then they send up a signal to other bacteria saying, come on down. It's a communication, it's called quorum signaling. And when those bacteria come down, then you start to have a biofilm, a whole infestation of them. Um, CPERS releases a little molecule that jams the communication networks of the bacteria and says, don't bother. And we've mimicked that now. It's called a furanone, and we've mimicked that. A company called Biosignal has. Sensing and responding, um, Tom will talk a lot more about that. The neat one I just heard about is uh, the locust. You could, did you guys have the big locust infestation here in Maine? Like they had, or farther south in Washington. And, um, locusts, millions and millions and millions in the air. Have you, did you see any collisions? <laughs> there are 3.6 million car collisions in the United States every year. They're looking at a crash avoidance circuitry based on the, on the locust's really giant neuron that picks up that signal and, and adapts quickly. We're looking at the uh, lobster, Maine, for uh, smelling underwater, smelling pollution plumes. This is a good thing, to smell a pollution plume and being able to track it back, the odor source back, so that you can stop. So, in conclusion, um, I know that that was a haiku of biomimicry. It was a race. But you guys have pretty sparky minds. So I figured, <laughs> I, I put it on fire hose. I figured you could take that. Um, but really, all of those amazing adaptations uh, pale in light of this one, OK? Um, Basically, this is what success is. And one of the things we have to do, one of our design challenges is to redefine success. Let me tell you how, what success is in the natural world of which we are a part. Um, success is keeping yourself alive and keeping your offspring alive. But it's not just this offspring of this emperor penguin. It's not the offspring in this generation. It's your genetic material 10,000 generations from now or more. And the key thing is that organisms cannot take care of an offspring 10,000 generations from now. All organisms, all we can do, is take care of the place that's going to take care of the offspring. It's key. It's key. So that's number 12, and that's that's the biggest one, and it's the big filter for me. So as you design, because I think we're all designers, um, the question I would have you ask is, how does my design create conditions conducive to life? How does it build soil? How does it clean air? How does it filter water? How does it make sure that the chicks have a safe place to live? Um, that's the challenge, and um, I, I feel comfortable and honored to give that challenge to such a smart, playful, and heartful group of people. Thank you. <laughs>